around the globe. The digital station for comedy, drama and entertainment. BBC Radio 4 Extra. Now, as part of 4 Extra's contribution to the BBC's gothic season, Sylvester Latouzel and the late Gerard Murphy star in this adaptation of Horace Walpole's classic, published exactly 250 years ago, and which is generally regarded as the first ever novel about a haunted castle, the Castle of Otranto. When Prince Manfred's only son is killed on the morning of his wedding, he decides to marry his late son's bride himself, and only the castle ghost seems to stand in his way. Some years ago, a mysterious manuscript was found in the library of an ancient Catholic family. Written in an obscure Italian dialect, the manuscript tells a tale of suspense, intrigue, and excitement. My name is Father Jerome, and I have the privilege of sharing this unusual story with you. Thrill as heroes and heroines fight and languish, shiver as villains pursue their dastardly ends, rejoice as love and devotion triumph. This is a story such as you have never heard before. Come with me and I shall lead you to that strange place where the rational and the superstitious meet, where love and hate, greed and generosity are so close that you cannot tell where one ends and the other begins, where motives are not always what they seem, where even my motive for telling the story is shaped by more than a familiarity with an obscure Italian dialect. The Castle of Otranto by Horace Walpole Dramatised for radio by Michelin Wanda With David Burke as Father Jerome Gerard Murphy as Prince Manfred Alfonsia Emmanuel as Princess Hippolyta Sylvester Latuzel as Isabella Susanna Corbett as Matilda, and Patrick Robinson as Theodore. The Castle of Otranto. The Castle of Otranto is the home of the great Prince Manfred. I am Prince Manfred. A powerful and willful ruler. Prince Manfred lives with his wife. I am the Princess Hippolyta, wife to Manfred, loving and obedient. His daughter? I am Matilda, 18, beautiful, young and devout. His son? <laughs> I am Conrad. Three years younger than Matilda, a homely youth. I love my son more than anything in the world. It is through him that the family name will be perpetuated, and with it, the ownership of the castle of Otranto. Prince Manfred has contracted a marriage for Conrad with the Marquis of Vincenza's daughter, Isabella. I am Isabella. I am beautiful. I am grand. I am noble. I am betrothed to a puny, sickly youth whom I despise. There is one more person who appears in this story. A young man. Handsome. Brave. But I must not anticipate. 
Conrad's wedding is at hand. Courtiers and guests have arrived for the nuptial celebrations. They are eagerly assembled in the castle chapel. They have been waiting for some time. Isabella must not be kept waiting like this, Hippolyta. Where is Conrad? Perhaps he is unwell, Manfred. He is so delicate. He is too young to be married. He is 15 years old, the perfect age to get married. Oh, Manfred, why can it not wait until he is older? If you had given me more sons, Conrad would not have to marry at all. The people say... Here, you, servant! Sire? Go and find Prince Conrad. Ah, uh, what, sire? And hurry. Now, Hippolyta, what do the people say? The people say that you wish Conrad to marry soon because you are afraid of the ancient prophecy. Sheer superstition! It makes no sense at all. Oh, but it must. Father Jerome, remind us of the prophecy. Oh, certainly, my lady. <clears throat> the castle. The castle and lordship of Atranto shall pass, shall pass from present the present family the whenever the real owner shall be grown too large to inhabit This prophecy makes no sense and has nothing to do with Conrad's marriage. I shall never be too large to inhabit the castle of Otranto. Ah, Prince Conrad at last. Let the ceremony commence. Manfred! Prince Manfred! What is it now? Conrad is ill. Oh, sire! I, I cannot speak. A terrible thing! Where is Prince Conrad? The courtyard! The courtyard over there! I know where the courtyard is. Is Prince Conrad in the courtyard? Yes, sir. That's exactly where he is. Exactly where he is. Well, go and tell him that he is late for his wedding. Hurry! But the courtyard! The wedding is in the chapel, not in the courtyard. Sire! The helmet! The helmet! Helmet? What helmet? What are you talking about? It is Conrad! Something has happened to him! Come, sire, and see for yourself! Indeed, I shall. Hippolyta, wait here. No, I am coming with you. Father Jerome, Matilda, Isabella, hurry, hurry! Oh, oh, look, my lord, the helmet, there it is. And there in the courtyard is an enormous helmet, a hundred times larger than any helmet ever made, shaded with a proportional quantity of sable plumes. It fell from heaven, sire, I swear, on the prince. Crushing young Conrad in his prime. What did you see? I was approaching the prince, your son, who was standing here in the centre of the courtyard and was about to summon him to the chapel when the helmet fell upon him. My son, my son. What a sight for a father's eyes. My child, my pearl. Dashed to pieces, crushed and almost buried under an enormous helmet. Why, it must have fallen from the moon. Conrad, where is Conrad? Oh, Matilda, help me. Mother, oh, mother. Matilda, remove your mother to her chamber. And you, servant. Sire. Look to the Lady Isabella and bring her to me shortly in my chamber. Sire. Remove the helmet from the prince. Oh, tragedy, tragedy. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, Prince Manfred! A young man approaches, a peasant from the village. Stand back, fellow! I must speak to Prince Manfred. Guards, remove this peasant! I recognize the helmet. Do not intrude on the prince's grief. If he knows something, let him speak. This miraculous helmet looks like... Like what, for heaven's sake? It is exactly like the helmet on the black marble figure of Alfonso the Good in the Church of St. Nicholas. 
The statue of your former ancestor. I've seen it with my own eyes. How dare you utter such treason? You shall pay. Seize this man! Help me! But of what am I guilty? Villain! Monster! You killed my son! How else could you recognize the helmet? Yes. But, yes. sir, yes. the helmet on the statue is of marble, and this one is made of steel and is enormous. It would be impossible for me to wield a piece of armor of so prodigious a weight. Sir! Sir! The helmet! The helmet from the statue of Alfonso in the church of St. Nicholas! What about it? It is missing! Oh. Young man, you stole that helmet. And somehow you have managed to enlarge it and transform it from marble to steel. You are a devil. You shall be kept prisoner under your own sorcery. But, sir, I am innocent. Remove the prince and place this peasant under the helmet. I'm innocent. I'm innocent. And so, Manfred's instructions are carried out, and the young man is placed under the helmet while Prince Conrad is prepared for interment. Meanwhile, the care and zeal of Matilda has brought Hippolyta to herself. This good and virtuous woman thinks not of her own anguish, but seeks only to console her lord. Matilda. Where is your father? I must see him. He does not wish to see anyone, mother. He is locked in his chamber with his grief. Oh, woe! Will he not permit me to blend my tears with his? Mother, you must rest. Manfred dreads the shock of my grief, lest it redouble his own. Very well. I will not add to his anguish. Ask Isabella to console him with her sympathies. Of course, Mother. I will ask Isabella. Thank you, Matilda. Manfred, meanwhile, has summoned Isabella to him for a purpose not confined to the sharing of sympathies. My Lord Manfred, the Princess Hippolyta has asked me to convey her condolences and love to you. Thank you, Isabella. It must be a cruel blow to lose a bridegroom. Indeed. But you know, Conrad was not worthy of your beauty. My lord, do not doubt my tenderness towards Conrad. Nonsense. He was a sickly, puny child. And perhaps fate has taken him away so that I need not trust the honours of my house to so frail a foundation. My lord, the shock of your grief has unhinged you. Lady, instead of a feeble boy, you shall have a husband in the prime of his life who will know how to value your beauty and who may expect male offspring from you. My lord, to whom do you refer? Since I cannot give you my son, I shall offer you myself. You, my lord? My father-in-law, the father of Conrad? The father of my closest bosom friend, Matilda? The husband of the virtuous and tender Hippolyta? I divorce her from this hour. Give me your hand. My lord! Isabella, mm. you shall be my bride. Let me go! Let me go! Mm. Ah! Oh, look! Look, my lord! There, in the courtyard. What do you see, my fair Isabella? The plumes of the fatal helmet which killed Conrad. Look! Look! Waving backwards and forwards in the moonlight. Look, my lord. See how heaven declares itself against your impious intentions. Neither heaven nor hell shall impede my designs. Come here, Isabella. <sighs> ah! Look, my lord! The portrait of Lord Manfred's grandfather moves in its frame on the wall and begins to descend to the floor. What is this? Oh, miracle of miracles. The old man 
descends from his portrait to the floor with a grave and melancholy air and beckons Manfred to follow him. Follow me. Do I dream? Or are there devils in league against me? First the helmet, and now this. Follow me. Lead on, old man. Follow me. Wait for me. I must hear what you have to say. Wait! Follow me. Open up! Isabella? Isabella, where have you gone? Wait for me! Isabella! Isabella! Guards! Find the Princess Isabella! Isabella runs through the cloisters. She recollects a subterranean passage that leads to the church of St. Nicholas. I must flee this terrible man. The passage is dark. I see her approaching and decide to aid her escape. Where am I? Where am I? The lamp, Isabella, the lamp. A lamp? Heaven has provided a lamp for my needs. Isabella is not the only fugitive in the cloisters. What is that? Ah! It must be the ghost of Conrad. Oh, woe is me. In the light of an imperfect ray of clouded moonshine, Isabella discerns a human form standing close against a wall. Who is there? Oh, sir. Whoever you are, take pity on a wretched princess standing on the brink of destruction. Be not alarmed, lady. I will not injure you. Indeed, if I can help you... Thank you, sir. There is a subterranean passage here to which the entrance is through a trap door. If I can find it... Look there. A ray of moonshine streaming through a cranny of the ruin above glints on a smooth piece of brass embedded in one of the stones. The trap door. A miracle. But how can I open it? Allow me. Stone steps. Heaven is with us. The steps are lit by gently glowing rose-coloured lanterns. In a few minutes I will be safe from Manfred's rage. Thank you, gentle stranger. You have saved my life. Isabella! It is Manfred! I am ruined! Isabella! Make haste! I will close the trap door behind you. Isabella! Farewell, gentle stranger. <laughs> you! Presumptuous villain! How did you escape from beneath the helmet? Look up and you will see. Looking upwards, Manfred sees that one of the cheeks of the enchanted helmet has forced its way through the pavement of the courtyard. As the guards let the helmet fall over me, it left a gap through which I fortunately managed to escape. Oh, fateful providence. But did I not hear the fall of a trap door when I entered this cloister? I am a man of truth. Providence did indeed show me a trap door. Then why did you not pursue the path pointed out for your escape? Why are you still within my castle? My uh, lord! My lord! You are a resolute villain for your my years. Lord! You must have some my further lord! plan. My lord! My lord! I suspect that you are trifling with me, young devil. Where is my lord? Where is Prince Manfred? Two of the guards who have been searching for Isabella. Jaques... Oh, my lord, I am glad we found you. The Princess Isabella, have you found her? And Diego. Jaques and I. Diego and I. We have been frightened out of our wits. Diego had such a fright. Your Highness would not believe what we saw. What new absurdity is this? We went to search for the Princess Isabella. And? And thinking that the young lady might be in the Great Gallery, we went there to look for her. Poor Diego. I do not believe he will ever recover again. Recover from what? Satan is in the great chamber next to the gallery. Diego went first into the gallery, for he said he had more courage than I. But I heard the noise first. Then I heard the noise. Jake Chris said to me, Is it a ghost, Diego? It is. It is a ghost. My hair stood on end. It must be a giant, Jake Chris, all clad in armour. Look, 
There is his foot and part of his leg as large as a helmet below in the court. Where is the rest of him? Dear Lord, as large as the helmet. Look, the leg is standing up. The giant is rising to his feet. He will trample us, Diego. Run! And so we ran. Quick, my lord. Send for Father Jerome and have the castle exercised. It is enchanted. This is all nonsense, utter nonsense. You are a pair of idiots. Oh, you're oh, doing we... our best. Where is Isabella? Uh, uh, um, we could not go back there, my lord, to look for her. <laughs> not for anything. Your Highness. Yes, what is it? May I help you look? My life is of no consequence to anybody. I fear no bad angel or ghost. Enough. I do not need your help. Diego, Jaques, take this young man and confine him to a chamber in the castle. Oh, my lord. Oh, my lord. Meanwhile, Matilda, shocked at the fate of her brother and concerned at the absence of her dearest friend, Isabella, is enjoying the ministrations of her servant, Bianca. It is not proper for me to be present at so intimate a scene. You tell Princess Matilda. Let me help you. Thank you, Bianca. <sighs> is there news of Isabella? Miss Isabella is still nowhere to be found, Princess. But Diego and Jaques, as they were seeking her, saw a gigantic foot and leg encased in armour in the Great Gallery. They said it sounded like thunder and began to move. Bianca, this is a fable. Such things do not exist. Well, Diego and Jaques do not tell lies. Powder? Thank you. Oh, you're so beautiful, madam. It's high time your father found you a husband. Nonsense, Bianca. But you are now his heiress. I'll be impatient to have you married. Shall I brush your hair now? Please. Oh, my poor Bianca. How can I be a great princess? My father's heart was always a stranger to me. And it wounds my soul when I am witness to his causeless severity to my mother. All men use the wives in that way when they're tired of them. But you must marry, princess. You're far too beautiful to mope in a convent for the rest of your life. Did you hear that, madam? It sounds like a cry of a restless spirit. It is only the wind whistling through the battlements in the tower. My chemise, please, Bianca. The peach satin. Here you are, madam. Suppose, madam, tomorrow morning your father was to send for you and you find at his elbow a lovely young prince with large black eyes, smooth forehead and jet curling locks. In short, madam, a young hero resembling the picture of the good Alfonso in the gallery where you sit and gaze for hours together. Bianca, you have been spying on me. No, madam. But when you behold Alfonso's likeness, such a look of happiness comes over you. Please, do not speak of that picture. I am not in love with a coloured panel. I merely contemplate it for its artistic merit. The ruby earrings, please. Certainly, madam. Well, to be sure, madam, you were born to be a saint. I must say, the Lady Isabella has never been as reserved to me as you are. She lets me talk to her of young men. Isabella may be of a cheerful disposition, but her soul is as pure as virtue itself. She knows your idle, babbling humour, and perhaps now and then has encouraged it merely to divert melancholy. Blessed Mary, there's that sound again. Do you not hear that voice? Dear madam, this castle is haunted. I do think I hear a voice, Bianca. A young man's voice. And if there is a spirit in pain, we may ease its sufferings by questioning it. Oh, no, dear lady. I would not speak to an evil spirit for the world. Oh. That is no evil spirit. It is only a man singing in the chamber below. Open the window, Bianca. I dare not, madam. I will open it then. My robe, please. There, madam. Thank you. Is anybody there below? Pardon me, lady. If I have disturbed your rest, sleep has forsaken me. Your words and accents are of a melancholy cast. 
If you are unhappy, I pity you. If poverty afflicts you, let me know it. I am indeed unhappy and poor, but I do not complain. Please do not think me proud or that I disdain your generous offer. Then why do you sigh, young man? If I sigh, lady, it is for another, not for myself. It is that young peasant, madam. I know his voice. Find out with whom he is in love, please, I beg you. What right have we to pry into the secrets of this young man's heart? Why, lovers have no pleasure that is equal to talking about their mistresses. Very well. You have aroused my curiosity. I shall inquire further. Stranger, tell me of your unhappiness, and I will endeavour to find help for you. You speak with humanity. Tell me, what do they say in the castle about Princess Isabella's absence? Is her departure linked with the fortunes of Prince Manfred? Why, you have gained my sympathy in order to pry into the secrets of Otranto's noble family. I was mistaken in you. You must be a spy. <sighs> well, Bianca, this peasant is not to be pitied after all. I will tell you a secret, madam. The other servants believe that this man contrived the Lady Isabella's escape. The other servants say that this peasant is a magician and that he stole the helmet from Alfonso's tomb and killed your brother Conrad. And then he used his magic powers to escape from beneath the helmet where he was imprisoned. Is it not peculiar that the Lady Isabella should be missing on the same day that this sorcerer is found at the mouth of a trapdoor? Do not breathe such suspicion on the purity of my dear Isabella's reputation. Pure or not, she has fled. That must mean something. Whatever the cause of Isabella's flight, it has no unworthy motive. If this stranger was an accessory to it, she must be satisfied of his fidelity and worth. I'm sure he must be a prince in disguise. And he must have some lucky charm or other about him. How else could he have escaped from under that helmet? You think everything is explained by magic, Bianca. Enough nonsense. I shall finish dressing. My shift, please. Certainly, madam. Manfred rises at the first dawn of light and goes to Hippolyta's apartment to inquire if she has heard news of Isabella. Of course, she knows nothing. It is left to me to bring enlightenment. I arrive, displaying my customary air of firmness, authority and virtue, always saint-like in its impact, not always saint-like in its motivation. Father Jerome, welcome. Lord Manfred, Lady Hippolyta, I have news of the Lady Isabella. At last. She is at St. Nicholas's altar. She has taken sanctuary there. Thank heaven she is safe. This mm. is no business of yours, Hippolyta. Please leave us. Uh, my commission from the Lady Isabella is to speak to you both. Why should Isabella instruct one of my servants with such a commission? I am the minister of a mightier prince than my own king. If you will pardon my directness. Proceed, Father Jerome. My Lord Manfred does not mean to be unkind. The Lady Isabella thanks you both for the kindness with which she was treated in your castle. As it is no longer possible for her to be allied with your family, she entreats your consent to remain in sanctuary until she can learn news of her father, who, as you both know, is lost in battle. I shall certainly give no such consent. She must return here without delay. Uh, she is where orphans and virgins are safest from the snares and wiles of the world. Nothing but a parent's authority shall remove her from there. I am her parent. Indeed, more than her parent. I demand her presence here in the castle. But my lord Manfred... Go now, Hippolyta. I wish to speak to Father Jerome alone. But my lord... Go now! Yes, my lord. I shall obey you. Has Isabella told you why she chose to flee the castle? I... Uh, I cannot break her confidentiality. As you please, Father Jerome. I will talk of other things. You have influence with Hippolyta. She is... A faultless and perfect woman who scorns the grandeur of this world. What now? 
persuade her to consent to the dissolution of our marriage and to retire into a nunnery. What an outrage. This is unexpected. But, uh, <clears throat> Uh, why do you wish me to do such a thing, uh, Prince Manfred? I have chosen that Isabella should be the mother of my son. Such blasphemy, and such a danger to me. I am the instrument of heaven, Lord Manfred. I reprimand you for your adulterous intentions, your wish to repudiate your wife, and your incestuous desires on your contracted daughter! Mm. Perhaps the church's disapproval will have some effect. Oh, Father Jerome, please, please help me. The man is shameless. <laughs> ah, let your tears flow, my lord. The sceptre which passed from the race of Alfonso to yours cannot be preserved by a match which the Church will never allow. It will if you do. If it is the will of God that your name must perish, then resign yourself, my lord, to that fate. There is something I have not told you, Father Jerome. Mm hmm? And what is that, Lord Manfred? For some time, I have had scruples on the legality of my marriage. I recently discovered that Hippolyta is a distant cousin of mine. It is to this state of unlawful wedlock that I impute all the events which began with the death of my dear son, Conrad. My lord, the church is an indulgent mother. Unfold your griefs to her. I need no mother. I am my own authority. Now, I order you to instruct Isabella to return to the castle. Mm. I fear that if Manfred has no hope of recovering Isabella, he may take her by force. I must encourage him and hope that I can delay the evil hour. Uh, my lord, on further thought... I see that you have a true delicacy of conscience towards your wife. I'm sure the church will be able to set you at liberty to find some lawful means to continue your dynasty. Good father, I welcome your generous understanding, and I will be generous in return. Now, since we understand one another, please tell me. The youth we found in the cloisters, is he Isabella's lover? Here's my chance. Some seeds of jealousy will help delay matters. My lord, I... I wished to keep it from you. So there is some passion between them? Well, I cannot be completely certain, but... I knew it! <laughs> I will fathom the truth behind this intrigue. I shall order the peasant to be brought to me in the Great Hall immediately. But, Lord Man... Enough! I must know everything! Excuse me, Father Jerome. Success. Success. Prince Manfred! Prince Manfred! I shall follow to hear this interview. Manfred is not to be trusted with the young peasant. There you are, madam. Bianca, you startled me. I thought I'd find you up here again, gazing at Alfonso's portrait. It is a consolation to me in these turbulent times to contemplate such beauty. It is your father, madam. Leave the young man with me. <gasps> Heavens, Bianca, is not that youth the exact resemblance of Alfonso's portrait? Indeed he is, madam. Now, tell me the truth. Who are you? My name is Theodore. I am a labourer from the next village. Oh, what miracle has sent him to me? How long have you known the Princess Isabella? Isabella? How can this be? Before last night, I have never seen the Princess. That is the truth. You helped her escape from the castle. Why? I am an honourable man and cannot lie to you. She told me she was on the brink of destruction. And on such extravagant words from a stupid girl, you were prepared to risk my displeasure? 
I fear no man's displeasure when a woman in distress puts herself under my protection. Manfred! These are the words of a lover. A lover? Oh, no, I cannot bear to hear this. Come, Bianca. It's Manfred! I shall say no more. Then perhaps this will make you speak. Miss Manfred, I must speak to you. Kneel down, young man, and prepare to receive your punishment. I would like to make my peace with heaven first. Very well, I cannot refuse you that. Father Jerome, your arrival is timely. Hear this young man's confession, and then I will see his head severed from his body. Prince, do not shed innocent blood, I beg you. Get on with your confession, young man. I have not committed many sins, thank heavens. Father, give me your blessing. Uh, I cannot bless you unless you pardon your enemies. And you cannot possibly forgive that unholy man there. I can forgive him. And I do. Uh, does this not touch you, O oh cruel prince? I am not moved by the whining of a priest. Remove your shirt, peasant. I will not. Very well, then. I will do it for you. <gasps> no. Father Jerome, your power to dissemble will be tested. Good heavens! The mark of a red arrow! And on the right shoulder! Why, you are my child! Theodore, you are my son! Father? <laughs> a priest? My father? Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. And yet the strength of my emotion surprises me. To be able to acknowledge my son for the first time. Oh, joy. My dear Theodore. Oh, my son. Oh, spare him. Good prince, spare him. Revile me as much as you please. But spare him. Peace. I must know more. A saint's bastard may be no saint himself. He is my lawful son, by the sign of the red arrow. And Sicily can boast of few houses more ancient than that of Falconara. Falconara? A house of Falconara, indeed. But alas, my lord, what is blood? What is nobility? <laughs> it is only piety that distinguishes us from the dust whence we spring. At any rate, this is what I want him to believe. Please, spare my only son, my lord. Tell me your true history, and do not try to obtain pardon for this criminal. It is natural that I should plead for this boy, and the memory of the dear woman who bore him. Where is she, Theodore? Where is your mother? That beauteous woman. Her soul has long been with the blessed, father. Oh. May she rest in peace. Prince Manfred, you have lost a son. You must understand my feelings. Well, Father Jerome... You have wrung my heart. I agree to grant you the life of your son. <sighs> oh, look, my lord! And there, outside, at the other end of the courtyard, the sable plumes on the gigantic enchanted helmet are nodding and agitating, as if bowed by some invisible wear. You see? Father Jerome, what means this portent? The plumes are shaken with greater violence. I do not know, my lord. Oh, horror. Some great omen is threatened. Unhappy prince that I am, holy father, what shall I do? My lord, submit yourself to the church and cease to persecute her ministers. Frederick? Isabella's father? How can that be? Lord Manfred, I come from the night of the gigantic saber. I must speak with the usurper of Otranto. 
usurper? Who is this insolent villain who dares to question my title? There has been too much insolence here. Retire! Father Jerome, go to your monastery and prepare for the princess's return. I will hold your son hostage for your fidelity to me. Good heavens, my lord, your highness has only just pardoned my child. Have you so soon forgotten your merciful intentions? This young man will be taken to the top of the Black Tower, where he will be strictly guarded. I have more important matters before me. A stranger who questions my authority. Father, my... take care. Theodore. My son, I will see you very soon. Father... Enough! I must speak with this herald! Speak, stranger. I come on behalf of the Knight of the Gigantic Sabre. My master, Frederick, demands the Lady Isabella, who you are basely and traitorously keeping in your power. He demands that you resign from the Principality of Otranto, which you have usurped from the nearest of blood to the last rightful Lord Alfonso the Good. If you do not instantly comply with these demands, he has sent his knight to challenge you to single combat. And where is this braggart knight? He is but a league away. He is a true knight, and you are a usurper and a ravisher. Manfred must know that it is dangerous to provoke Lord Frederick. Herald, return to your master. Bid him welcome to my castle. Tell him that I do not wish to resolve our differences by the sword, but by amicable means. I will do so immediately, sir. During this exchange, my mind is agitated by a thousand contrary passions. I tremble for my son's life, but I cannot allow Isabella to return to a union with Manfred. I must remain in the castle to await an opportune moment to plead for Theodore's life. Meanwhile, from the battlements, we witness the arrival of the knight and his entourage, who are to fight on behalf of Lord Frederick. A hundred foot guards, and as many horse, fifty footmen, in scarlet and black, a rider bearing a banner with the arms of Vicenza and Otranto woven together. Damn his impudence! A hundred gentlemen at least, bearing an enormous sword, seeming to faint under the weight of it. This is the gigantic sabre. Heaven preserve us! Then the knight himself on a chestnut steed, in complete armor, his face concealed by his visor, surmounted by a large plume of scarlet and black feathers, like those on the enchanted helmet in the courtyard. In a tempest of wind, the plumes of the enchanted helmet agitate in rhythm with those on the knight's helmet. A light, Sir Knight! And rest. You and your friends shall enjoy the laws of hospitality in my castle. The saber bursts from its supporters and falls to the ground opposite the enchanted helmet. What portent is this now? Manfred pales briefly and then recovers sufficiently to sustain his welcome. Come, my guests! This disruption is irrelevant. Enter, I pray you. A feast is prepared. Join me. <laughs> Throughout the feast, the knight sits impassively, his visor still concealing his visage. Afterwards, Manfred seeks to converse with him. Now we have feasted, 
let us talk. Pray be seated. As you know, Prince Alfonso bequeathed the castle of Otranto to my grandfather, Don Ricardo, in consideration of his faithful services. And Don Ricardo bequeathed it in turn to my father, Don Manuel. The knight shakes his head. Frederick, your lord claims to be the nearest in blood. But report speaks him dead in battle. The knight is non-committal. You also wish me to deliver up the Lady Isabella. Are you authorized to receive her? The knight nods. Do you have full powers? The knight nods again. Sir, you see before you the most unhappy of men. Give me your compassion. I am entitled to it. I have lost my only hope, my joy. Conrad, my son, died yesterday morning. The knight nods in sympathy. Sir, you behold in me a man for whom power and greatness have no more charm. I am a man of many sorrows. Isabella is now at liberty. The knight finally breaks his silence. Do you then restore her? I do. But I have a dilemma. I wish to restore the line of Alfonso for the sake of my people. Heaven, in your arrival, has pointed out a remedy. The Lady Isabella is at liberty, and I shall soon be so as well when my divorce from Hippolyta is made secure. Were it not the best and only way to extinguish the feuds between our families, I would not do it, but, alas, I must take the Lady Isabella to wife. A prince must serve his people. It is time for me to interrupt. My lord, I must speak to you. What is it, Father Jerome? She was in her chamber when I left, my lord. And when I return, sir, believe me, I am innocent, quite innocent. What has happened? Isabella is gone. Gone? But where? Believe me, she was safe. You have lied to me, Lord Manfred. Out of my way. I must find Isabella. Sir Knight, let me go with you. I know the territory. I can help you. I can summon attendants to accompany you. We can find Isabella together. Very well, then, but hurry. Hurry! While Manfred accompanies the knight on his quest, Matilda has recovered and resolved to seek out the young man who bears such a resemblance to Alfonso's portrait. She learns from the servants that he is confined in the Black Tower. She makes her decision. Who is that? Young man, though filial duty and womanly modesty condemn the step I am taking, yet holy charity will justify this act. You must surely be an angel. The doors of your prison are open. Fly! Only last night I blessed myself for helping you to escape. Just as your compassion so charitably helps me now. May I know your name? You are in error. It was not me you helped escape. Now fly, virtuous youth, while it is in my power to save you. Then, whoever you are, give me your lovely hand and let me bathe it with warm tears of gratitude. Oh, forbear and be gone. How could Isabella approve of seeing you at my feet? Who is Isabella? Oh, you are deceitful now. Was it not your lovely self that I assisted to find the subterranean passage to sanctuary yesterday? Ask me no more questions. Suffice it that my name is not Isabella, but Matilda. Come, fly! Theodore's soul is free from guilt. I shall not flee. <sighs> what is that? It must be the effect of the pent-up vapours in this tower. Nothing more. I hope so. Come, let us go. Matilda first conducts Theodore to the armory, where she equips him with a suit of armour. Then, 
they go to the castle gate. Behind the forest is a chain of rocks hollowed into a labyrinth of caves that reach to the coast. There you may hide until you can sign to some vessel to put on shore and take you off. Go now, before your escape is discovered. Thank you, Matilda. I entreat your permission to allow me to swear myself eternally your knight and to protect you forever. The tempest rises. You must leave. Hurry now. Her gaze holds him. Matilda, my darling, I love you. His eyes are fastened on hers. Go. Go, Theodore. Matilda. Matilda. They tear themselves away. And thus ends an encounter in which the hearts of both parties have drunk deeply of a passion which both are tasting for the first time. Here in the forest, Theodore seeks the gloomiest shades best suited to the pleasing melancholy that now sits in his mind. He has met his true love. Ah, what memories this brings back. Help! Help! Who is that? Where are you? Oh, oh sir! Oh, sir! Madam, do not be afraid. I will defend you, whoever you are. Surely I've heard that voice before. I do not think so. Unless... Why, you must be the Lady Isabella. Oh, do not deliver me up to Manfred, I beg you. Gentle princess, do not kneel before me. Come, let us enter this cave. I can have no peace until I have placed you beyond the reach of Manfred. But what if we are found together? I respect your virtuous delicacy. But beauteous and perfect as your form is... My soul is dedicated to another. Isabella! <gasps> I am undone! It is Manfred! Where are you? Halt! Who goes there? I seek the Lady Isabella. Do not impede me, or you will risk my displeasure. Your purpose is as odious as your resentment is contemptible, Sir Knight. You impudent young man! Take that! <laughs> And that! How about you? There! And there! There! He is disarmed. Thank you, kind friend, for saving me from Manfred. He will not be any danger to you now. What? Our generous foe, we have both been in error. I took you for an instrument of the tyrant Manfred. And you have made the same mistake. Oh, heaven protect us. This is not our enemy, Isabella. Isabella? Is this she? It is indeed I. Who are you? Are you... Pray, tell me truly. Are you Isabella of Vicenza? I am she. Then Isabella... Here you see your father. My father? You, my father? But how come you here, sir? Lord Frederick of Vicenza? I am indeed Lord Frederick. Your father, Isabella. Oh, father! Uh, sir! Suffer us to convey you to the castle where you will be cared for. And please forgive me for my mistake. You are forgiven. Another reconciliation which gladdens my heart. Theodore, shedding tears over his victim vowing to guard Isabella with his life, carries Frederick to the castle, Isabella following mournfully behind. In the castle, they are met by Hippolyta and Matilda, who 
blushes to see Theodore and Isabella together, suspecting some alliance between them. When the Marquis's wounds are treated and declared not serious, Hippolyta takes charge of Frederick's care. Here, Lord Frederick, drink this. <clears throat> Thank you, Lady Hippolyta. If you are able to speak, Lord Frederick, I have something to ask you. Uh, what is it? Why did you come to reclaim your daughter? Let me tell you my story. Do not exert yourself too much, I pray. <laughs> While prisoner to the infidels, I dreamt that my daughter was detained in a castle where she was in dreadful danger. I set out to rescue her. For three days I wandered in a forest without seeing a single human being. On the evening of the third day, I came to a cell where I found a hermit who told me his secret. Long ago, St. Nicholas appeared to me and revealed a secret which he bade me disclose to the first man who visited me. And you are the first human being I have seen for fifty years. You, Lord Frederick, are to dig under the seventh tree to the left of this cave, and you will be rewarded. Now, go. Quickly. The following day, I dug and discovered an enormous sabre. The very weapon which lies yonder in the courtyard. Heaven protect us! On the blade were written the following lines. Where'er a helmet that suits this sword is found, with perils is thy daughter compassed round. Alfonso's blood alone can save the maid, and quiet a long rested Prince's shade. Help me, Hippolyta! Help me! What is this dreadful spectre that follows me? My gracious lord, what is the matter? Look, look how it follows me! But I, I see nothing. Is this ghastly phantom sent to me alone? Oh, for mercy's sweetest sake, my lord, resume your soul. Command your reason. It is Alfonso! Can you not see him? That, my lord, is Theodore. Theodore in armour. Theodore? But he was confined in the Black Tower. How did he escape? Lord Manfred. Father Jerome, you helped this young man escape. You are a traitor. Young man? Is, is this Theodore? I can see that Manfred is still struck by Theodore's armour-clad resemblance to Alfonso. It is time to tell me your history, young man. Who are you? My lord, my story is brief. When I was five years old, I was taken to Algiers with my mother, who had been captured by pirates off the coast of Sicily. She died of grief in less than twelve months. Woe is me. Before that, she bound a document under my clothes, proving that I was the son of the Count of Falconara. <gasps> what wondrous news is this? And my father, this good man, Father Jerome. <sighs> this is your father? Now it is time. Indeed, I am. The Count of Falconara. Oh, more and more wondrous. Two years later, I was delivered from the pirates. In Sicily, I discovered that my father's estate had been laid waste, and he had retired into religion in the kingdom of Naples. Indeed, that is true. It was the only way to assuage my sorrows. Destitute and friendless... I took the first opportunity to sail for Naples, and from there I wandered into this province, supporting myself as a farm labourer. I 
can now add something to this young man's story. What is that, sir? Uh, he is one of the bravest young men I have ever met. He defended my daughter's life with his own. And if I pardon him for attacking me, then surely you, my Lord Manfred, will pardon him as well. This deserves some considerable thought. Young man. My Lord Manfred, Lord Frederick is tired. Shall we not leave him to rest? You are wise and compassionate, Hippolyta. Come back to the convent with me, my dear Theodore, where we may talk further. With your permission, Lord Manfred? I have no choice. Who am I to come between father and son? Meanwhile, Matilda has returned to her chamber, her thoughts in turmoil. She is convinced Isabella loves Theodore and is fearful that her love is returned by him. Well, Isabella, so you have been twice delivered by Theodore. I cannot believe that this was accidental. Theodore has told me that his heart is engaged elsewhere, but perhaps the object of his passion does not yet respond. Are you still insensible to love, Matilda? Indeed I am. All my thoughts are set on heaven and the religious life. Come, Isabella, tell me the truth about Theodore. Despite the fact that he saved me, he also wounded my father. Therefore, I hate him. And yet he is handsome. Well, I cannot deny it. The servants have said that your father is out of danger, so you should not harbour resentment against him, for I am sure he did not know that the Marquis was related to you. You plead his cause very effectively. Perhaps he returns your sympathy. This young man confessed to me yesterday that he was in love. I'm sure that he loves you. My dear Matilda, it is not I, it is you that Theodore admires. Isabella, you saw him first. You must have him. No, no, I can see that you are in love with him. You must have him. I could not be with him knowing that you, my friend, were pining for him. He must be yours. I am convinced of it. I shall fight to conquer my passion for your sake. Oh, Isabella, what a struggle of generosity you have had. The dignity of your virtue knows no bounds. I can recognize true passion when I see it. You are my dearest friend. Uh, my dear Matilda and Isabella, I am glad to find you both here. Mother, welcome. I have something important to tell you both. What is it, Mother? Heaven intends that the scepter of Otranto should pass from Manfred's hand into that of the Marquis Frederic. What? I have been inspired with the thought of averting our total destruction by the union of these rival houses. With this view, I have proposed to Manfred that he should offer you, my dear Matilda, as a wife to the Marquis Frederic. Me? To the Marquis Frederic? Good heavens, my gracious mother, how can you contemplate such a thing? Wretched princess, what ruin is this? Oh, what can this mean? Alas, madam, you are genuinely pure, and that prevents you from seeing the depravity of others. Manfred, your husband, is an impious man. Please do not mention my husband Manfred with such intemperance. He will not long be your husband if his wicked intentions are executed. What on earth can Manfred have done for you to suspect him in this way? He wants to separate himself from you, to divorce you. Divorce my mother? Yes, and to complete the action he intends... Oh, I cannot tell you. But you must. I was contracted to your son, Conrad, and now his father wishes me to marry him instead. What? Isabella, can this be true? No madman, no force can drag me to Manfred's hated bed. And you, my dear friend Matilda, I could not wound you by injuring your mother. It is not for us to make our own decisions. Heaven, our fathers and husbands must decide for us. If Manfred and I are to be divorced, then so be it. If Frederick accepts Matilda's hand, I know she will obey. Mother, how can you say that? I have a secret which I must now tell you, Mother. What other calamities has fate in store for us? Mother, 
I am in love. Passion? In this hour of destruction? Of which man do you speak? It is Theodore. I am in love with him. He has weakened my resolution to devote myself to the religious life. But he is poor. He is a mere peasant. He is, however, nobly born. You have heard of his lineage. Isabella loves him too. But I am prepared to resign him to my dearest Matilda. And Theodore? He does not suspect any passion from either of us. Well, that is some consolation. You must refrain from having any further contact with him, Matilda. I will. I will. And I will go straight to the convent to pray to give us guidance. In these terrible times. What turmoil. I can agree to leave Theodore. But why must I wed another man? Please let me come to the convent with you, Mother, and shut myself away from the world forever. Your fate depends on your father alone. Goodbye, my child. I go to pray for you. Meanwhile, I am about to hear the same news from a different point of view. You seriously want me to believe that you are in love with the Princess Matilda? Indeed I am, Father. You must eradicate this guilty passion. Immediately! She's from a rival house. Remember Manfred's greed and tyranny? Can guilt dwell with innocent beauty and virtuous modesty? It is sinful to cherish those whom heaven has doomed to destruction. The tyrant's race must be swept from the earth unto the third and fourth generation. Thus pronounces the prophecy. But will heaven visit the innocent with the crimes of the guilty? Have you forgotten that Manfred has condemned you to death twice? Certainly not. But I have also not forgotten that it was the charity of his daughter that delivered me from his power. You are a model of charity yourself, my son. But the insults you have received from Manfred must shock the ashes of the good Alfonso. I am the most wretched of women. Good father, may I speak to you alone, please? Theodore? Of course, father. I shall leave you to pray with the virtuous Hippolyta. Oh, father. Hmm? Isabella has informed me that Manfred wishes to divorce me and marry her. I have suggested to Manfred that Matilda should marry Frederick in order to unite our houses and to preserve us from the rivalry that might be in store for us all. Horror of horrors. Hippolyta wishes to accede to Manfred's demands? This cannot be. That is not a good idea, Princess. Father, would a separation from my Lord Manfred be legal? She is indeed serious. Oh, my lady, your consent would be the utmost in sinfulness. I assure you, the church will denounce you if you comply. You should treat any such proposition from your Lord Manfred with indignation and refusal. But even while Hippolyta seeks guidance, Manfred also approaches the church for advice. Hippolyta. I am surprised to find you here. What business brings you to this cloister? I came to pray for the best outcome for our family, Manfred. Lord Manfred, I have to tell you that all your impious and immoral schemes are known to me. What? The church despises you, and her thunders will be heard above your wrath. Do not proceed in this cursed proposal of a divorce. It is too late. I am determined that Frederick should accept Matilda's hand and waive his claim to Otranto if I have no male son from my marriage with Isabella. Look! Three drops of blood fall from the nose of the statue of Alfonso. It is a sign from heaven. Mark this miraculous indication that the blood of Alfonso will never mix with that of Manfred. My dear Lord, let us submit ourselves to heaven. 
Oh, do not think your obedient wife will ever rebel against your authority. It is my Lord and the Church who rule me, and it is to the Church that we should appeal. We cannot burst the bonds that unite us unless the Church approves of the dissolution of our marriage. Father Jerome is wrong. This is a sign that heaven does approve. You, meddling friar, are no longer welcome under my hospitable roof. And as for your son, I banish him from all my dominions. Whoever marries Isabella, it will certainly not be the Duke of Falconara's upstart son. You will see what fate has in store for you, O oh cruel prince. Fate has my best interests at heart. Excuse me, I must return to my castle. Bianca! Lord Manfred? Bianca, I wish to speak to you. Yes, my lord. You are beautiful and clever, Bianca. Oh, thank you, my lord. There cannot be much that happens in this castle that you do not see. Indeed, no, my lord. It seems to me, Bianca, that the Lady Isabella has been looking very preoccupied of late. Well, my lord... Come, tell me. Is there a young man who engages her affections? Oh, my lord... I shall give you a jewel brooch. Oh, thank you, sir. No need to curtsy. Tell me truly now. a secret? Of course I can! Well, I do not think that my Lady Isabella ever loved your son Conrad. Of course not! I knew that! Tell me truly now, how long has Isabella known Theodore? Oh, your highness, nothing escapes you. Well, Theodore is certainly a very proper young man. As my Lady Matilda says, he's the very image of the good Alfonso. Has your highness not noticed it? Well, perhaps there is a slight likeness. <laughs> All the women in the castle are in love with him. Uh, We'd all like to have him for our prince, uh, but if we could. I mean, uh, when your highness is no longer here. Is that what everyone hopes? I see. Well, thank you, Bianca. You may go now. Thank you, my lord. Concerned that matters between Isabella and Theodore may interfere with his plans, Manfred resolves to ensure that Frederick is content with the proposition to marry Matilda. But... Scarcely has he begun to introduce the matter than they are interrupted. Oh, oh my lord, my lord, we're all undone. It's here again, it's here. What is here? Bianca, be calm and tell me and speak quietly. Lord Frederick is still unwell. Let, let us speak. A, a hand, a giant hand, I saw it. It must belong to that giant suit of armour from which the helmet came. What on earth do you mean? Your Highness, the hand has come to warn us all. It must be the same hand that belongs to the foot which Diego saw in the gallery chamber. Do you remember? It cannot be. Father Jerome has often told us that the ancient prophecy would come true one day. What happened exactly, my dear? Well... I was going to my Lady Isabella's chamber when I heard the rattling of armour. Such a clatter! The same clatter that Diego said he heard when the giant leg frightened him in the gallery chamber. Is your castle haunted by giants? Let us dismiss this silly wench, my lord. We have more important things to discuss. On the top banister of the staircase there was a hand as big, as big as anything. I ran and I ran and I ran until I got here and I shall leave this castle as soon as I possibly can! Oh, <laughs> I do apologise, Lord Marquis, that my servant should behave in this way and spread such tales. Come, let us return to more important matters. We shall bury our feud, as I have promised, by the intermarriage of our children. I'm afraid that the judgments that have already fallen on your house forbid me from coming into it. My lord, your conscience and your guilt accuse you. You may keep your daughter... And think no more of Isabella as a bride. But Matilda is beautiful, is she not? She is indeed very beautiful. I am glad you are drawn to her. And she is fond of you, I am sure. Tell me, has Hippolyta consented to your divorce? Not yet, but she will, I am certain. Think again, I implore you. Matilda will make you very happy. 
<laughs> Perhaps I will reconsider, <laughs> Lord Manfred. <laughs> she is very beautiful. Excellent. I shall leave you to rest now. Good night. And while Lord Frederick sleeps, a figure in a long woolen cloak approaches him. Lord Frederick. <gasps> Angels of grace, protect me. You deserve their protection. Do you remember me? Of course. You are the spirit of the holy hermit whom I met in the forest. What can I do to help you rest in peace? Listen to me. Were you delivered from bondage merely to pursue carnal delight? Have you forgotten the giant saber? and the command of heaven which is engraved upon it. I have not. But tell me, O oh blessed spirit, what is your errand for me? I order you to forget Matilda. Forget Matilda. Oh, Matilda. Forget Matilda. Matilda. How my soul veers to and fro in a conflict of penitence and passion. Hmm? Huh? Uh, who, who is there? Pardon me, my lord, for disturbing your rest. I have heard that Theodore and a mysterious lady from the castle are in private conference at the tomb of Alfonso in St. Nicholas's church. I am sure it is your daughter, Isabella. Oh, we must go and see immediately, Lord Manfred. Manfred's inflamed spirits at the prospect of Isabella's tryst infect Frederick. Together... They glide softly between the church aisles, guided by an imperfect gleam of moonshine. They steal towards the tomb of Alfonso. Look, there they are. Let us watch from behind this pillar. Then you will be mine. If it just depended on me. But my father will never permit our union. Manfred takes out his dagger. Traitor! You are mad! Think you so? Father, oh, Father, please! Take that! Ah! I am slain! Matilda, is it you? Savage, inhuman monster! What have you done? My daughter! Oh, woe! Give me the dagger that I might dispatch myself! What's happened here? Oh, Matilda, my dearest Matilda! <laughs> Father, help, help us! Theodore! I am faint. My child, my child. Father Jerome, pray comfort my father. Now, tyrant, behold the completion of woe fulfilled on your impious head. The blood of Alfonso has cried to heaven for vengeance. You cruel man, to aggravate the woes of a parent. May heaven bless my father and forgive him as I do. I thought you were Isabella. Oh, Matilda. Can you forgive the blindness of my reign? I can. And I do. Where is my mother? I must see her. Here. Hippolyta approaches. Tell my daughter. And Isabella, too. My dearest friend, Matilda. Mother. Isabella. Matilda, do not despair. What sight is this that meets my eyes? Matilda, my friend. Come, father. Give me your hand, and mother, give me yours. There, place your hands together in mine. I curse the day I was born. I am sinking fast. Since she cannot live as mine, at least she shall be mine in death. Father Jerome, will you join our hands? Young man, you are ill-advised. Do you think we must listen to your fond transports in this hour of fate? What right have you to marry this princess? The right of a prince, the sovereign of Otranto. This reverend man, my father, has informed me who I am. I am the only true prince of Otranto, now that Manfred has forfeited all claims by committing an act of murder. My lord, it is true. Theodore is the heir to Otranto. It is not my purpose that the secret should have been told so soon, but time presses on. No, that This when is not the time for explanations. Father, come. Unite me to the princess. She shall be mine. My adored Matilda. Will you be mine? Oh, my child. 
Weep not for me, mother. I'm going where sorrow never dwells. Commend me to heaven and forgive my father, dearest mother. Isabella, Theodore, for my sake. As the full moon appears from behind the clouds, the walls of the castle are thrown down with a mighty force. The day of judgment is at hand. The form of Alfonso, enlarged to an immense magnitude, appears in the center of the ruins. There is the giant helmet, the suit of armor, and the sacred saber. Behold! Prince Theodore is the true heir of Alfonso to the castle of Otranto. As the clouds part, Alfonso ascends towards heaven, met by the form of Saint Nicholas. The two are wrapped from mortal eyes in a blaze of glory. Farewell, Alfonso! Rest in peace! Farewell, Alfonso! My Lord Manfred, behold the vanity of human greatness. Conrad is gone. Matilda is no more. In Theodore we view the true prince of Otranto. By what miracle this has happened, I do not know. But our fate is pronounced. Let us dedicate the few hours we have to live in commending ourselves to heaven. My heart is finally open to your devout admonition. Hippolyta, it is time for the truth. Alfonso died by poison, and a fictitious will declared Ricardo, my grandfather, his heir. Haunted by guilt, he vowed to St. Nicholas to found a church and two convents if he lived to reach Otranto. The saint appeared to him in a dream and promised that Ricardo's heirs should reign in Otranto as long as any male issue from Ricardo should remain to enjoy it. These are Theodore's dominions. I hereby resign them. It is time to reveal all. When Alfonso set sail for the Holy Land, he was driven by a storm onto the coast of Sicily. There, he fell in love with a beautiful young woman called Victoria. They were married. He left her pregnant. And during his absence at the crusade, she was delivered of a daughter. Scarcely had she felt a mother's pangs than she heard the rumor of her lord's death and the succession of Ricardo. The horror of these days and the vision we have now seen corroborate your evidence. The daughter of whom Victoria was delivered was bestowed in marriage on me. Theodore has told us the rest. Tomorrow morning, I sign my abdication of the Principality. That is truly noble, Manfred. Then you and I, Manfred, can each take on us the habit of religion in our neighboring convents. With delight, my dear Hippolyta. And you, Prince Theodore, you may have my daughter Isabella in marriage. I cannot. My grief for Matilda is too fresh to admit another's love. We may talk frequently of Matilda, Theodore. You promise that her image will never be erased. I promise. Very well, then. 
I will agree. After all, I could find no happiness except in the society of one with whom I can forever indulge the melancholy which has now taken possession of my soul. Come, let us return to the castle. And celebrate the new prince of the castle of Otranto. The, the new, new prince of the castle of Otranto. And so, Otranto is returned to its rightful heir, and I finally achieve my greatest desire to destroy Manfred and his greed and place myself where I belong. As father to the prince, no request is denied to me. I live and love as I please. I have comfort and I have ease. One day I may choose to reveal how I discovered Theodore's whereabouts and carefully engineered his progress towards the castle of Otranto. One day I may choose to explain how I created the giant suit of armor and the mysterious Alfonso. <laughs> One day. But then perhaps the magic and the portents are all real. After all, goodness and virtue have triumphed, and evil has resigned. Perhaps I will keep my counsel and reveal nothing. After all, the Renaissance has many secrets, to which we may add the mystery of the castle of Otranto. <laughs> In The Castle of Otranto by Horace Walpole, dramatised for radio by Michelin Wonder, Father Jerome was played by David Burke, Prince Manfred, Gerard Murphy, Hippolyta, Alfonsia Emmanuel, Isabella, Sylvester Latouzel, Matilda, Susanna Corbett, Theodore, Patrick Robinson, Bianca, Catherine Apanovich, Federico, David Fleischmann, Diego, Robert Whelan, and Jayquees, Jason Doan. Other parts were played by members of the cast. Technical presentation was by One Stop Digital. Post-production by Paul Smith. The music was composed and played by Andy Roberts. The play was directed by Chris Wallace. The Castle of Otranto is a watershed production for the BBC. Castle of Otranto. And if you enjoyed that, tomorrow afternoon, Rory McGrath will take us on a guided tour of the original Gothic castle and the gloomy world of creepy dungeons, trap doors, and skeletons in cupboards. That's a guided tour of Castle Otranto tomorrow afternoon at 1.30. And talking of spooky things. Hello, I'm Andrew Maxwell, and I'm inviting you to my Halloween Hooli on BBC Radio 4 Extra. This is the haunted chair, isn't it, here, John? We have songs, we have cake, we have ghoulish shaped vegetables. What more do you want? It's a turnip. <laughs> <laughs> Join me, my friends, if you dare. She has a lamenting voice that's so piercing. You'd never mistake it for something else. I am a G-H-O-S-T. I'm a ghost. <laughs> Join me, Andrew Maxwell, for my Halloween hoolie. On Friday night, from 7 till 10 on BBC Radio 4 Extra.